Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing Sky Tier Horde, a game from Sky Tier Games, who previously were PvP geeks, they've rebranded Sky Tier Games, they put out, as you might imagine, Sky Tier, and this is in the same universe, but totally different game. If you've hated Sky Tier, that has nothing to do with this game. If you love Sky Tier, that has nothing to do with this game, although I guess they both have powers and abilities in a way that I actually would recommend them both in that sense, but we can talk about that later. Point is, they are different games. This, by the way, is a prototype, so everything you see here, rules, components, all that stuff, subject to change, this will be launching, I believe, on Kickstarter, 99% sure, I'm never certain anymore, but 99% sure this is on Kickstarter, I'll have a link down below, but like I said already, Sky Tier Horde, this is a, a solo or cooperative game in which you are basically trying to attack the enemy, take down their gates, take down their boss, as they slowly load up cards into the card row that you have to deal with. In the meantime, their cards are trying to take down your health, your castle, reducing it to zero. Any uncontested enemy on either side is doing damage to the other side's gate or castle. So it's that balance of basically two life forces, similar to a game like Magic the Gathering, similar to a game like Hearthstone. It has that aspect of you have different people being put on the board, uncontested people will deal damage to the life force, and then contested people go back and forth, plus powers and abilities, that is effectively what this game is. Just that, that's the genre of game, that style of game, except, like I said already, this is solo or cooperative, this is not a competitive experience. The general gameplay is all listed on this little handy dandy player array, excellent player array by the way, goes through everything beautifully. Basically, you're going to start every single round by gaining mana. You'll gain mana equal to the number on the current gate. Right now, there's three gates over here. We have to go through each one. When we reveal the third gate, we're also going to reveal the boss over here. So you can have a boss that will be coming out, and then you want to basically take down the boss at the end of the game. But you're going to gain mana. Each player will gain mana equal to the current gate level. Each player, how many players there are, whether one, two, three, whatever it is. And yes, these gates do vary by player so that they are uh, modulating for the difficulty. Uh, from there, you're going to go to the next step, which you go ahead to go to the horde phase, where we summon horde cards. You summon horde cards equal to the number over here, which is relevant, the number in the top left corner, which is relevant because these gates are slowly turning. So that's going to be one card on the first turn, three on the second, three on the th two on the third, four on the fourth, and then back to one, going round and around, although somewhere along that way you'll be taking out the gate. So we're going to go ahead and reveal one card from this deck over here right now, and we're going to put it in the row. And it's either going to be a monster of some sort, in which case it'll go in the row, or in this case it's a spell, in which case you do whatever the spell says. This one's going to have us summon two red minions, adding them to the card, and then snipers deal two damage to the most wounded ally, unless a player discards a card from their hand. So if we had any wounded allies, we'd have to take the damage. Alternatively, let's go ahead and discard a card to avoid that happening. So spells are bad things that will happen, uh, minions are bad things that will have to be dealt with, and that's what's slowly being added to the row. A single card can often be dealt with. You have your hands, you have your mana, you can do what you need. Three cards is a whole different conversation, but that will be the, the nature of the escalation. From there, we move to the alliance phase. The alliance phase is where the players are going to take the various actions that they want, mostly utilizing mana to play cards, and then to navigate and position things as needed. So cards all have a mana cost in the top left corner. They have abilities as well, so there's going to be various creatures, which will have, you know, your attack modifiers over here, your attack and your health, and then they have their ability on them potentially, and then you have various spells that will have, you know, hey, here we go, we have return up to two allies from your discard pile to your hand, a one cost spell. So there's different spells and or abilities and instants, different kinds of things like that in order to control for the battlefield. Past that, you are allowed to position yourself as needed to take out various enemies, I can move this ally over here to deal with that one, or alternatively, you can choose to engage with the minions, and that's important. Those minions will represent a growing threat that needs to be dealt with. I, I use the word needs with a capital N. If you do not deal with the minions, you're going to have problems on your hands. So let's give an example over here. We're going to go ahead and we will play, let's find a cheap ally we can play. Ooh, this is a fun one. This is perfect. Okay, we're going to go ahead and play this one. We're going to pay two mana. We're going to have a mana from mana pool. We'll pay two mana. We'll play this one over here, and then we'll draw this minion down to engage with it. Strictly speaking, you have to pull it to the left most empty lane, but I can rearrange my people as necessary, so that's not a problem. Sometimes that can be a problem, but let's not worry about that for right now. So we're going to go ahead and position it like this, just so you can get a good feel for how things will play out as we go through things. Let's go ahead from there, and let's, there's a lot more we could have done for the sake of just showing you an example of how things play out. I'm just going to do that. From there, when we're done moving, engaging, playing cards, and all that, we flip to the next side of this card, and we start going through the treasury phase. The treasury phase represents the unknown. The idea that we may have perfectly planned for X, Y, and Z, but we're going to reveal this card, and now we have a treachery effect. The boosted monster, which is the leftmost monster because the symbol is on the left, the boosted monster gets plus two, plus zero for each of their neighbors. So that creature over there is going to go ahead and get two, plus two for each neighbor. The neighbor's over here. So he's going to get plus two attack, which is not the bestest, not the worstest. From there, we go to the fight phase. In the fight phase, we're going to resolve the lanes left to right. 
So we're going to start with this creature over here who's going to penetrate through because it's uncontested over there. He's going to deal 5 damage because only champion is engaged. Nope, not, not relevant. He's going to go ahead and do 5 damage. Plus, if he damages the castle, we deal we pillage two cards. So he's going to deal five damage to the castle, which is not great. And because he dealt damage to the castle, we're going to pillage two cards. Each player pillaging cards, slowly weeding their deck. You see, you lose in two situations. Either your castle is reduced to zero zero health left, or alternatively, any player runs out of cards. If you can't, if you're supposed to draw and can't, you lose. That's not true for the enemies. It's only true for you. Uh, from there, we go to the next lane. The next lane has shade hounds. Shade hounds, if they are engaged, move them to the rightmost empty lane. So shade hounds like to avoid any form of engagement by jumping around the board. So they're going to jump over there now, and then again deal four damage to the castle. This, by the way, this sample round I'm showing you. There's not one that goes well for this player over here. Fortunately, I'm not going to actually finish this game when I'm done. From there, this player is going to go ahead and deal 3 damage to the gate, so that's the upside. We do have the ability to hit the gate back because they chose to uh, not be engaged. And then, there we go. Okay, from there we go to the next uh, next over here. Over here, this creature has a fight ability that I can return Clan of the Wildcats to my hand. And if I do, the Horde monster on the other side just simply doesn't deal damage. Basically, a little bit of a dancing and pivoting around the other creature. I have to pay two mana every turn to keep that up, but it does mean that my choices right now, let's show you how a combat would play out if we kept it here. If we kept this here, we have this minion over here. Minions are always equal to the strength of their minions on both sides. So it's a 5-5 creature right now, because that's how many minions there are in play. So a 5-5 five, five creature versus a 2-3, I would deal 2 damage to them, reducing their minion count by 2, and then they would deal 5 damage to my 3, and I would die. Right now, I don't want that to happen, so I'm going to simply return this to my hand for that ability. There are times when you might be willing to take that. In fact, this creature over here might have been willing to engage because it's a 4-6 creature, could have dealt damage, reducing it to 1, and then be left with 1 health left. Damage does stay round to round. So we can go ahead and do that. In fact, a better play. A better play over here would have been playing this over here, playing this over here, and dealing with them that way, because that way we would have ignored that 5 damage, ignored the 2 pillage, and this one could have dealt with that. But we're not going to do that. We're not going to replay this right now. That's not the point of this ex exercise. From there we move to, well, that's basically it. We now are done with that whole lane. I already did the this one over here. Technically, I should do it last. But either way, we're already done, which means we now move to the pillage phase. The pillage phase is any unengaged minions, which are 1, 2, 3, 4. This one has no actual minion tokens. It's the card, but not the tokens. So we have a total of 4 tokens. All unengaged minions are going to cause us to pillage cards from our deck. 1, 2, 3, 4. Each player removes 4 cards from the deck. This is why I drew that 5-1 down, even though I wasn't engaging with it. It was worth it to me. This should be back in my hand, and this should be on the table. It was worth it to me. Oh, and this one does 4 damage to the gate. We should probably do that. That's going to reduce the gate down to 0, bringing us to the next level of the gate. But either way, we're not going to go be going that far. But the reason I, I drew that down is because I didn't want to discard five more cards. If I didn't engage with this minion, we would have discarded five more cards each, and that is not that is not good. I have lost this game as many times from losing my entire deck as I have from losing my castle. It's a, it is a balance you have to be mindful of. And I still will have to deal with that five over there because it's only going to get stronger unless something is done to uh, take it down. But that's basically the way the escalation plays out. You're done with the pillage phase, you move to the ending phase, you reset... Go to the next round, the gate rotates if it were still alive, it's, it's not, I killed it. The gate rotates, we're going to be drawing three cards next round, rinse and repeat until you eventually have the boss come out by the third gate, and then eventually either take down the boss, or somewhere along the way, your castle got reduced to zero, or one of your decks got reduced to zero, and you're dead. And either of those things can happen as often as the other. And that's basically Sky Tier Horde. Mix it up with various decks, uh, various types of ability decks you have. Each player chooses a color they can work with. Mix it up with various enemy decks, various bosses, various anything in the game. And that's the game on the table. Which brings us to the review of everything, starting off with ease of play. The rules are fairly short, fairly easy to go through. Some stuff isn't necessarily immediately obvious. I find this is a game that you can actually go through the rulebook pretty quickly. You'll have a bunch of edge cases as you go through it. And, and this is very much a prototype stage, so take this into account. But I found a lot of little edge cases that weren't even dealt with in the rulebook. Uh, FAQ type situations that I'd rather have them addressed. It is easy for me to simply rule past them. It, I don't love doing that as someone who's reviewing and or playing games online. Because I like there is going to be a film play over on Quackle where we play the game. And it always makes me neurotic that I might have a rule wrong so I don't love that aspect of things, but I would say it was easy enough to get through things uh, as a player with having to house rule, but again, prototype stage, so hopefully some of those things get cleaned up, uh, if we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, table space is fairly minimal. What you see here is what you get. Uh, more players adds 
nothing really. It adds a deck of cards in a hand, so whether you're playing with one, two, or three players, it doesn't really matter. It's going to roughly be the visual space you see here, fairly small. Uh, game time comes in, I would say, generally at 30 to 60 minutes. If you're knocking through it solo, it can be closer to that 30 minute stage. If you're playing with another player, uh, or another player or players, then I find it that drifts closer to the hour as there's more table talk going on, more back and forth. As far as player count, Player count, this is a one to three player game. I played this so far at one and two. I have not played it at three. I don't, I'm, I'm fine playing it at three for context, just based on my experience so far. But I, I imagine that one and two, more specifically two, are the sweet spot. Well, let's cover that soon. I imagine one and two are the sweet spot, at least myself. I would be willing to play it with three, but it feels like it would get just a drop more cluttered. Not necessarily something I'm rushing to, something I am willing to. Uh, past that, as far as, so that's going to be player count. Oh, and interaction. Interaction is high. Interaction is very high in this game as you work together, as you try to figure out how we're going to deal with the enemies. What are we going to do? to take them out. Lots of table talk, lots of discussion as you figure out how you can interact and, and play off each other's cards. Or, well, if I do two damage to this creature, can you take that one out? What Can you deal with this one? I can I can jump in front of this one and absorb the damage. What about those two? Do you have those? Lots of, of cooperation as you work together. You can play open-handed. My general recommendation would be not to, especially if you are potentially subject to alpha player, meaning the idea that someone will just read all the cards and then run the game. If you play with a closed hand of cards and you just discuss things, then I find there's a lot more agency for any individual player to have their own strategy, their own contributions to the game. So generally, my recommendation would be uh, closed-handed, although you can theoretically do what you want, like my cards right now are on the table. As far as what I like, didn't like, and can see others not liking. First of all, you feel like you're going to lose all the time in this game, which on its own is a bad thing, for me at least, my own preference, but you actually tend to win the game more than not. Again, for myself, based on my own experience, and I haven't upped the difficulty. The cards, the gates do come in diff different difficulty levels. I've been playing at standard, but I always feel like I'm going to lose, but then I find the pattern and win. This is something I've seen in games like uh, Spirit Island is a good example, or I don't know other examples offhand, but I, I generally like it when a game has, has that aspect in which you feel like you're going to lose. Because... To me, uh, cooperative games shine when when you win, you feel like you could have lost, and when you lose, you feel like you could have won. To me, it's about that tension of of feeling like the, the need to, to out-math or out-strategize whatever is being thrown your way. And this game very much gives you that. When you draw a single card early game, not necessarily the end of the world, and then you draw three cards and you're like, I don't know how we're not going to be struggling here. I don't know how we're not going to be taking tons of damage. Our creatures that take so much mana. I mean, this is a seven mana creature. Sure, it's great, but seven mana. You never you never get seven mana in a single turn. You have to hold it over turn to turn or have abilities that let you play with that. And so there's a lot of struggle to get things down. And you don't, by the way, you don't draw cards unless you kill creatures. You do not draw, draw cards inherently in this game. You may have noticed I didn't discuss that you draw cards. You only draw cards when you kill a creature, which means you need to be killing enemies to actually keep your economy going. And, and if they come out in a way that hurts you, you might find yourself in a downward spiral that escalates quickly. And so there's a terrifying aspect of we're not going to make it. And then you find an ability, then you find a card, then you work together and discuss things, and you see a way out of that problem. And I love that aspect every single time. I love that that finding the pattern in the game, that, that sense of challenge that presents itself, but the finding a way past that. And there's tons of powers and abilities that let you do that. The cards themselves, the abilities, the creatures, everything gives you a ton, a ton of stuff to work with as far as how to maneuver past that problem, as far as what you're going to do. It's not like you're handed, okay, great, here's just a few statistics or not. Here's like a few attack modifiers, a few defense modifiers. There's a lot going on. On that can min max or, or not really min max that would be attack and modifiers there's a lot going on that gives you abilities out of your problems and i like powers and abilities in general and sky Terror horde gives that to you in spades it gives you these combos that you can deal with again things like oh well i'll bump up buff up your creature by two and then you'll have something that lets you negate damage this turn or you'll have some sort of a modifier that does x y and z lots of stuff to work with lots of things that really give you that that sense of crunch and the game does have variable difficulty i i think i'm ready to start moving too hard at this point but i'm always i'm always mindful of it because i'm enjoying myself at normal difficulty i'm enjoying myself at the struggle but then often getting past that struggle not always but often getting past that struggle but for those who want it this game does have variable difficulty so you can escalate that to be more punishing for yourself as much as you need and it plays well both at solo and two player now i will say for myself while my first plays of this game were true solo playing a single deck of cards against a single enemy i don't think i would do that anymore 
as soon as I switched to having a two-player game, the first time I had a two-player game, I was kind of done with playing it solo. Uh, meaning, I'll play it solo, but I'm going to play it two-handed now when I play it solo. The sense of compatibility and, and, and back and forth of your two decks as you try to figure out the way the decks will synergize, I found that significantly more rewarding to the fact that I still play this solo, but now I only play it two-handed solo when I go into it. So you can take that into account. And for context, I enjoyed regular solo just fine until two-player kind of spoiled it for me. So that uh, plays well both those player accounts and gives you that. As far as things I didn't like, despite my talk about how you can often see the pattern through the, through the cards of how you can actually survive, sometimes you just get hit with stuff that doesn't work. Sometimes you get hit with bad luck, and if you fall behind, you will die. This game does have a mechanic that I do not typically like in games, and I don't like it here either, I just like the game despite it. But the sense of cascading failure. Cascading failure is the idea that when something goes wrong, it makes it that much worse, that much harder for the next time. It's the idea that a single step backwards can hurt you for the next step, can hurt you for the next step, and just put you in a downward spiral of just not being able to do anything or win in the game. Sky Tier Horde does have that. If you don't, don't draw the right cards, if the wrong enemies come out, and if you can't find your way out of the pattern this round, and you get hit too hard, next round's harder. If you're not killing creatures, you're not getting cards. And if they kill your creatures, you have less defense. Next round can be harder, and you can find yourself with a combination of bad luck and or just not seeing the pattern, and then things escalate until you're just dead. So that does happen in this game. It's something worth noting that... And, and so it, doesn't happen, it hasn't happened enough for me to not like the game, but it is something to be mindful of in the game. And then last thing what I don't like, and this is more of a prototype complaint, I think, but, I mean, I know it's a personal complaint, the question is how much, which is, I want more for this game. A lot more. I don't know what the final game is going to have, I know what I have as a prototype, I know what I have as limited, but I want a lot more enemy cards, a lot more boss cards, a lot more player cards, I want a lot more. I have played this game a decent amount, and I'm already getting a little bit of a samey feel from the way things escalate, because you see a decent amount of your deck every single game, you see a decent amount of cards, the enemy decks you see a lot. I want a lot of content for this game. Uh, not what they have now. I want like I want a minimum of three times the amount of content they have right now. I don't know what their plans are, but I really, really do want more for this game because I, I feel, yeah, I, I, just, I want more is what I'm going to say there. As far as things I can see others not liking, two things here. One of the facts, one, one we kind of just already, which is luck of the draw is present. You could have enemy cards that will come out in ways that hurt you more. You could have your own player cards that get drawn that don't really help you. And so there's definitely luck of the draw here. Top decking the right card can give you the need, the win you need for that round. Top decking the wrong card can not give you the win. Top decking for context is pulling the top card of the deck and then hoping it's the one that you really need. And then secondly, and this is something that shows up some games, sometimes, depending on how you escalated, depending on how you built, the end game can be anticlimactic. What I mean by that is sometimes you get to the end game, your boss comes out, and then you go one, two, three, and take out the boss one turn, and it's easy. Now, I've never had this game be easy across the board. Not once from all my plays have I had a single game where I was like, well, this is an easy one, I can just totally take this out. It has always been a struggle as I try to figure out how I can piece together things to make it work. But what I have had happen is sometimes that mid-game struggle leaves me stronger than the enemy, and I have a better deck, better hand, better something, and I walk into that final fight with a full hand of cards, no enemies on the other side, the boss comes out, and I can just take them out. So I have had anticlimactic endings. It doesn't bother me because I get the sense of struggle throughout the game, but it's something worth noting that some of my games, not all of them, have had easier boss fights when you hit that end, and I don't have an easy way to fix it, by the way. Because that only happens if you had a strong mid-game. If you make the boss more difficult, then, then you have a problem if you didn't have a strong mid-game. So maybe there's a way to have some bosses be situational as far as how strong they are when they come out. I don't know. Again, it's not a big problem for me either way. Just worth noting. As far as final thoughts and rating on Sky Tier Horde. This is one that's really solid. And it also, more importantly, I'd say, it feels different than almost anything I have in my collection. There's only one thing. When I was trying to think through the recommendations, comparisons of other games, which I'll get to at the end of the video, I can only really think of one thing that gave me a similar feeling. And it's a game I love. We'll get to that soon. But it feels fairly unique in the way it handles this kind of genre, this kind of game, and the puzzle it gives you. That aspect of not drawing cards unless you kill enemies, that's really tight in a good and bad way. And it sort of feels like a solo Hearthstone-style gameplay, at least at first, although... Although it has grown past that for me. It has escalated to uh, being a just drawing cards dealing with enemies to a real tactical puzzle as you try to figure things out. The sense of struggle as you attempt to see how you can simply not die this turn is present. And that also means that the reward when you actually figure that puzzle out is just as present. It's even stronger. This one's a 4 to 5 for me. I'm really enjoying it. Although with the, with the caveat that I really do need more content for it to hold that rating. 
It is a four to five for me, but if I didn't get more content for this game, and again, I don't know how much more content there will be in the final game, but if I don't have a decent amount more content, this is one that will drift downwards as I get a little sameness in the eventual playing, multiple, multiple plays of the experience. So yeah, four to five with that small caveat. As far as other game recommendations, as far as other game recommendations, first of all, Sky Tier. Sky Tier, the big brother, not same universe, but not same game. If you like the comboing and the powers and abilities, Sky Tier has that very much in a head-to-head -head game. Very different implementation. Does not feel that similar, but the general idea of combining powers, abilities, of comboing, of finding patterns, both of those will be present. Those aspects will be present in Sky Tier as well. As far as the other game I'd recommend, especially if you like this and or if you like that, then maybe look at this, is Marvel Champions. Marvel Champions is the closest game I could think of in my collection that really feels like this. The idea of drawing one or two cards that have to be dealt with, and the idea of looking at your own hand and trying to find the patterns of the ways you can figure it out. Now, it will have that potential mathy aspect as well as you try to min-max and find things and look for those kinds of patterns, but I would say that if you like Marvel Champions, it's worth paying attention to Sky Tier Horde. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you found this video helpful, and as always, have a good one.